what's up bloomers so this is a heavily requested guide i know a lot of people love the class guides but trap has been especially requested after my video on the board game geek character strength poll where i was surprised that trap was the lowest ranked saying that it was at the very least middling uh there's definitely a bit of a response about that of people arguing and or asking so how do i play it correctly so the goal of this video is to teach you that and it couldn't be better timed because I just completed a retirement for this class, so it's actually really fresh in my mind. And it's also nice because this has actually been one of my more favorite classes to play, so I'm going to talk about it at length. Unlike other guides where I kind of jump right into the cards and the concept, we're actually going to be covering a lot of uh, trap and ways to optimize how to play the class in conceptual before we get into the cards. Without further ado, let's dig in. As per usual, uh, it always helps to hit like and be sure to subscribe. We'll have all sorts of Frosthaven content releasing every month. And if you really want to support us, check out our Patreon. It really does help. And I do have a GoFundMe if you want to contribute to my surgery fund directly. So the trap is a low health, low hand size character, which I think was initial turn off for some people. And it requires a lot of uh, setup to play correctly and some understanding of that. So with a nine, a nine start hand size and a starting health of six, I think some people naturally found classes like that a little bit more difficult if you don't immediately have the weapons available you to you to use it so i'm going to talk first off about zoning and we're going to talk about how you can use that effectively as a trapper i'm going to derail just for a little bit to talk about warhammer 40k warhammer 40k is something i played for a significant amount of my life and one of the more recent additions i was playing an eldar army and the biggest thing was everyone dropping deep strike where you could pull uh, people out of reserve don't even set them up and then when you deploy this forces you had to be a certain amount of inches away from all enemies nine inches to be specific so if you were able to cover up and patch all these holes you're able to kind of zone out this whole thing so a lot of the times when i did set up for these uh tournaments i would just set up in a way that it was impossible i actually specifically remembered one guy uh and he spent so long during his ter first turn trying to figure out where to and just resigned just deployed basically in his own deployment zone he basically just kind of gave up his big first strategy and did not kind of denied him that first turn advantage if anything he probably would have been better if he would have placed them on the board so he could move up so i almost allowed him to skip a turn and that's the same concept we're going to be using here in Frosthaven, denying enemies because they just don't have the space to operate with uh, their ability to either operate effectively by almost stunning them, but for more we'll be talking we'll be talking about effective disarms, which is usually how you're going to be working with the traps. It's kind of the same way the Craghart operated in uh, Gloomhaven. So if you like Craghart play, the trapper play will definitely be up your alley. So here's an example where we just placed one trap. As you can see, the corpse would normally get to the trapper with its uh, behavior card here but since uh, the trap has now been placed here you can clearly see that the path requires an additional turn to get to the trapper effectively losing its turn this time uh, it's still going to get closer obviously but at the same time it's no longer going to be performing that attack and the more you elaborate you make it the more turns you can potentially delay them of course you have longer moving enemies like chaos demons that will be uh, harder to zone out and that's okay uh, a lot of times you can potentially block some areas off entirely and force them to even step onto traps or uh, you have the ability to very easily come up with for example here as you can see on other sides using obstacles and other uh, pieces of terrain we've now made it to where this normal thing just just three traps now has turned from a move one to a move six to get to the trapper so of course this is definitely more effective on those slower enemies like those frozen corpses because those frozen corpses you can like drop traps dance around them and effectively negate their ability to even uh, deal hits uh, so faster enemies are kind of a harder matchup and the bigger matchup is clearly enemies with like flying but like the biggest thing is you don't necessarily want to wall off everything for example here uh we've now walled it off entirely the enemy has nowhere to go he has to step into a trap so he just steps into it and hits uh, hits the blink blade right here could could work you're gonna damage it but at the same time if you placed it here um, you're going to be able to avoid it and then eventually if you block up another trap you're going to potentially just force them to step into it anyway preventing damage versus dealing damage sometimes you want them to step into the trap so this is the case is if you want them to step in the trap maybe there's one health and it's going to finish them off this would be a good deployment if you actually just want them to deny the turn maybe the blink blade's low on health this is the way to do it also what type of traps is pretty critical 
So let's say I wall it off here like this, and the enemy is going to move around this way towards the Blink Blade but not quite get there. The Blink Blade can now step on this healing trap, healing them for, an, depending on, you have access to four healing traps at level one, so uh, heal them for four and then allow them to attack the enemy after they've gone. Especially if the imp's Blink Blade's gone slow, they can now move onto the trap with their slow movement after the enemy's gone, go in there, get a heal, and hit the enemy. This allows you to effectively use traps as those effective disarms while also using those same traps to heal your allies. Also, take note if there are really good choke points where you can have another path around. For example, what you see here. This path is insane because if you wall off this entire side, they're like, well, let's just try to go over this way. And they'll try to funnel because they'll eventually be able to have paths where they're going to eventually get to some of these spots on this side. However, uh, they could have easily just gone through the trap and start all attacking you. But this is effectively multiple disarms, multiple stuns. This is rarer, but I've seen this in some scenarios, and it becomes incredibly powerful and incredibly effective if you can pull things like these off. So be aware of these choke points and scenarios and use them. So like I said, like in the Chaos Demon, for example, uh, it's going to move too fast. However, sometimes Chaos Demons have attacks that multi-attack. Plenty of people have abilities that multi-attack or abilities where you don't want it to hit a specific person. For example, yourself. Maybe you can direct it towards your tougher ally. For example, the, the Trapper who's now redirected uh, with traps to move it towards the Drifter. Let's say the Drifter has a retaliate thing in place. He wants the demon to move towards it. So now you can kind of redirect traffic towards him and kind of pile enemies up around it. So at the very least, now uh, there's fewer enemies able to fit in that tight area. Additionally, if they do have like especially melee multi-attacks, it's harder to do in a confined area, especially if you shut off the routes, because they if they can add targets by moving into a trap, they're not going to, which is huge. Also something to note, um, I know in another video I talked about doors and how doors can be one of the deadliest parts of Frosthaven or Gloomhaven, uh, traps is actually incredibly important because you can kind of drop traps on doors, unlike the Cragheart. Uh, if you literally like, hey, I'm going to open this door, if you guys are long resting, we'll like funnel them through, and at the very least, they're going to have to step on a trap immediately, especially if you can are able to drop like or move a high damage trap onto the door. You could potentially like kill an enemy on their way in to fight you uh, just immediately, which is huge. We've had that happen only once, but a lot of times it's just been very interesting to use the Trapper's Toolkit of the amount of positive and negative traps to effectively deal with enemies. So obviously positive traps have a positive effect, for example, healing, strength, and bless, and uh, damage traps usually are you know damaging, but they also sometimes will have negative effects like just wound. For example, the level two card drops a zero damage wound trap. So the biggest thing is use the terrain in the scenario, build around it, because if you're just building a trap like a, a wall in the middle of like a void space here, it's harder to get the benefit of that. Whereas we're here using some of the obstacles in the scenario is so much more effective. So keep that in mind. Just a general core concept of the trapper, sometimes n weaker numeric values aren't actually weaker. Um, for example, there is a trap that creates one damage traps, which sound very bad, but creating two traps instead of one, sometimes the volume is more important than the actual damage value. So that trap becomes incredibly powerful. Being able to drop traps as your bottom action and top action allows you to more readily fill up effectively a trap path or a trap wall or some way to force enemies to navigate in the way that you dictate. This is why the class's control is so high. With that amount of control and defense, you can effectively control so many enemies how they go. So these are just a few scenarios in which uh, should be able to help you figure out how to either wall off enemies, reduce number of attacks, just stop attacks altogether, or funnel enemies into one area in order to just reduce the number of attacks coming in, because reducing the number of attacks coming in is the way to effectively the, that's effective disarms. That's how it works. That's where the control f comes from. That's where the healing comes from, although you clearly have your own healing as well. That's the best way to play it. Then you have other stuff on top of it, but now we're actually going to get into the concepts of the class. So the Trapper actually has a pretty good arsenal of damage and healing traps, uh, clearly leaning a little bit more heavily towards the damage traps, but the damage traps, um, one of the big best parts about them though is they have several abilities via like extra teeth or uh, dismantle and other abilities where you can effectively start stacking and merging traps together. Dismantle is kind of where it all starts, where you can destroy a trap and then move it on top of another and combine the two of them, which is fantastic. Um, the, the part that I like most about this is that um, 
you can uh, like hold off on a trap and then it turns out they don't uh, trigger it and uh, then you can kind of build it up and you're just like using it to wall off enemies and then either force an enemy to step into a larger damage trap or you can chuck that trap with the top of dismantle to force them to take damage so Effectively, you're kind of like holding off on using it for a while and just building up the damage until you actually need to unleash it. Now, sometimes you're not able to hold it, build it up for very long. Like when I was playing it very early, I got one up to like an attack 15, but there are some scenarios where I couldn't even get them up to beyond 10 before I needed to use them. So um, your mileage may vary. I think the highest I've ever done in a round with traps is 40 some damage uh, using, I think at that point I needed level, it's a level six card as well. So uh, you, you can actually get to some pretty incredible numbers but it does require some setup and some other stuff in play so uh, you won't reliably always be able to and it of course depends on the scenario in that case the scenario is to defeat a boss so trying to build up the biggest trap possible and trying to knock it through it is clearly the strategy of how to deal with a boss that's constantly spawning demons so I'm gonna go over the mechanics of some types of traps so um, damage traps make sense they're just damage we're kind of just gonna go through that pretty blandly damage and wound traps although i love wound traps wound traps are far less effective because they step onto it get wounded and they don't take damage till the next turn if you do force them into that trap or whatever or if you trigger knock them into it that's still pretty good i'm not knocking them they're pretty good but there's clearly better options uh depending on what you have like the snake pit the immobilized trap is one of the best things you'll have because if you force an enemy to step through this then they could they'll stop in the middle of their move. And if that stops, if they don't have the ability to finish their turn because their focus is no longer in range or not out of range by the time that movement finishes, they stop and then they're going to be mobilized on their next turn. This can allow you to hold off enemies for two turns effectively. So Snake Pit is one of the best traps for that. Of course, its bottom is a little bit harder to use. Its initiative is not great and the damage is lower than some of the other traps, but it does give you some of your greatest amount of control. But this, of course, does require you to either A, knock them into that trap or be uh, set up a wall that forces an enemy to walk into it eventually so um, it has a little bit more limited use but you do have the ability to have stun and immobilize traps stun traps don't come along until well you do have some lost ones at level one and that's actually it's 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 very very good uh, because it's a loss with your hand size it's not something you're going to readily do but anything that stuns I don't think there's any disarm traps, but there's stuns and immobilize. Uh, those kind of traps will absolutely be critical. Strength and traps are really, really, really good. Uh, I want to talk about them because I remember and when I was talking about enhancements back in Gloomhaven, where I was talking about specifically strength and bottoms were just too good, and we had to change how the enhancement system worked just because of that. A strength and traps basically work like a strength and bottom, which is gonna be honest a strong bottom trap just the problem with enhancements being so good uh where you had strength and adding that to certain actions on the bottom like move to heal to and then strengthen to that heal to and then boom all of a sudden that card becomes another effect you don't even care about the healing you just care that you strengthen for that top action you're going to do that turn and then for your entire next turn um these strengthen traps effectively operate that same way which is huge and it's wonderful so that's a big deal so strengthen traps, use them like that. Of course, it does depend on your team. Uh, in my most recent playthrough of using the trapper, had a problem where my team actually wasn't making a lot of attacks or we had like a lot of summons. So it didn't end up being as effective, but it's really good if you have like uh, hard hitting people, especially if you have like uh, drifters and uh, blink blades, so on and so forth, like things that actually are going to use a lot of their attack modifiers. And uh, so strengthen traps and healing traps both have the same benefit where you can wall it off and make an enemy take a long path and then your allies realize that this trap the enemies will think that this trap is dangerous it looks like a trap it talks like a trap it's dangerous except it's not dangerous it'll actually help them so you can have your allies effectively treat those traps as free spaces if anything beneficial spaces where they can use to attack enemies but enemies are going to try to walk around them so i know the damage traps sound great you're going to get all the damage you're going to stack it up and you're going to be like aha i am a god of damage or goddess of damage that's cool and it is great and i love it it's 
fun, but the support traps are just so good too. So don't rest on them. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite traps I kept using was a two healing trap all the time. It's basically one of the best cards on the whole class, but um, uh, just because of the other things and initiative on it. But ultimately, um, use those to zone them out, but also allow your allies because your allies are going to be like, yay, the enemies aren't attacking, but at some point in time, they might get annoyed at the amount of traps you're dropping. So if you can, if you, especially if you're playing in four player, uh, do include an assortment of positive traps. I personally use the Bless Trap a lot because our initial group had uh, plenty of use for it, and that was just easier to stack up than uh, strengthen traps, which do need to be timed uh, in an effective way. So I'm going to kind of focus a little bit into three separate builds. If you're familiar with my other guides, we're going to be talking about effectively using 4th edition Dungeons and Dragons terms, because 4th edition is the greatest Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, so we're going to be talking about, they're all going to be controllers. Uh, so this is going to be closer to a controller build, but you're either going to be full controller, or you're going to go into striker or uh, leader build. So uh, you can call leader or support build if you want, but leader, um, leader controller, full controller, or striker controller, uh, depending on how you deal. So we'll have a list of what cards to pick. But uh, I do want to go over when we do start about talking about the cards. N the best way to play the Trapper is to use every card in your arsenal. There are sometimes over time where some cards will get deprecated because uh, you no longer have functions for them, but you still bring the same function. So you need to be the ability to deal with people with flying. You need the ability to zone people out with multiple traps, so on and so forth. You're going to bring everything to fit the scenario. And um, if you sometimes you don't need to be have the ability to stack up 30 damage traps. Maybe you do for a boss, but maybe the end, this scenario doesn't need those. Bring what best fits the scenario. I know I say that for every class, but it's especially important to the trapper. Look at what you're playing and what you're going to need to bring. So let's talk about the cards. The first card we're going to talk about is Caltrops. Caltrops is your basic, first off, move 5 is fantastic. Initiative 25 is okay. It's pretty good, but it's not the undercut you want. As a matter of fact, uh, the Trapper is going to suffer from the fact that it doesn't have good undercuts. It does have one at the initial start, but it's too conditional to use as it, in my opinion. Uh, fortunately, you do have some decent initiatives along the way, uh, as well as two very good cards with very reliable bottoms that are solid, but those are higher level cards. 25 is not great, but this is one of your initial zoning cards. Caltrops is your bread and butter zoning trap. It gives you two traps within, uh, wait, range two? Yeah. It gives you two traps within range two, even though they're only one damage. Uh, primarily, what you're going to be using for Caltrops is not to get the one damage, but more so to get enemies to start having those long paths. Especially if you compare this with either a trap laid from last turn or a move and then drop a trap, you can now effectively drop three traps in one turn at level one very easily. And uh, this is the best way to start creating those long paths towards enemies. And if you have the initiative to go before them, you might be able to create this path to effectively control enemies on the first turn and reduce the number of attacks immediately. With the amount of classes in Frosthaven that have set up turns, this might be huge for you because this might be something you will need to do immediately to reduce the hampering that your party's like got, especially if you've got like a Deathwalker who's going to drop Call to the Abyss into play and a Drifter is going to do a setup turn and you're like, what guys, what are you doing? Like, give us one turn and you watch as all the enemies close in on you. You can say, no, I got this fam. Caltrops is one of the best for that. Also, move five, you don't have a non-loss move five. Actually, I don't think there's like loss movements. Um, and you don't have a move five until much higher level five. And even then the top on that's really good. So it's something you're going to be using that often. So just as an added note, the bottom is going to be really useful regardless. So this, but remember, two traps is the bread and butter for zoning enemies. The next card, Boar Catcher, is definitely more of your damage trap. First off, the initiative 20 is better undercut than most. Uh, it's going to be used for that. Yes, this card is going to be basically in your hand almost every scenario, even once you get to the mid levels. Uh, four damage trap is really hard to complain about. Range two, it's just got everything you want. Uh, it's hard to complain about. It's, there's not much to talk about. If you need to force an enemy to walk through a trap because you want to deal damage to them, this is the one you're going to start with. And uh, the bottom is a jump four, which is really strong. So as I said, this is it's, it's really hard to elaborate more on this. Jump four is you're going to need it for that mobility. And I, you're going to need to bring at least a couple cards for mobility every scenario. So even if you start to think like, hey, I'm going to use some other damaging traps or whatever for the top, at the, the jump four is hard to turn down regardless. And the last of the damage traps, 
uh, non-loss damage traps at level 1 is Spike Pit. Spike Pit has the 3 damage trap. Spike damage is a 3 damage trap uh, within range 2. So it does less damage than the Boar Catcher and more damage than the Caltrops, but you only get one, but it does immobilize. This is the one that if you want enemies to uh, screw up their turns because you want them to step onto it, this is the one you want to use. The Initiative 47 is the one of the worst ones you'll have out of your whole toolkit, so unlike Caltrop and Boar, Boar Catcher, which have better initiatives, this top is uh, harder to use because you're going to want to either, if you want to go late, you're going to have to pick a later initiative. If you want to go early, you're going to have to use some bottom to go with it. And the bottom is harder to use. It's not good. This bottom's great, by the way. It allows you to rearrange traps. Specifically, you can pick two traps within range two and move them out to range four of you. Uh, you can move them around as you wish, especially after enemies have been doing annoying paths. You can use this to kind of move traps around and effectively kind of disarm them for longer or change the path to force them to now step onto a trap. Um, but unfortunately, since that's got a little bit more of a condition to it, because you're not always going to want to do that, and the fact that the top is uh, kind of a, a hybrid useful role, because not always are you going to need to mobilize this card, is definitely one that is going to be like kind of rotated out a little bit more often than the others. But in some scenarios, it's going to it's the one damage lower then boar, the boar catcher is going to it's going to beat out boar catcher in so many scenarios especially if you're like dealing with those algox because those algox are they're big they're beefy and uh they hit really hard but if you can make them do nothing for two turns that is so much value and this is one of the ways to do that but if you're in an area that's heavy with snow imps this is probably a card that you're just not gonna bring unless there's other parts of the scenario that demand it. So let's get more to the healing traps here, although I know there is another damage trap. It's a replace. We're going to get to that later. Um, so Enticing Bait is the first one. Uh, a four healing trap, it looks a lot like Boar Catcher. The only problem is where the Boar Catcher's bottom is universally useful and the initiative's great. Uh, Enticing Bait's initiative is slightly worse at 30, and the bottom is harder to use. However, a healing four trap with one experience on top is very good. F four healing, zone an enemy out, and get an experience. I mean, it's just the, the spear real here. That's that's a very good trap, especially if you have a group that can use that healing. Um, this is a good way to kind of zone out enemies uh, and provide support for your group, especially if your group lacks healing. This can go a long way to either help build up your trap wall while also healing the allies as they finally get to take care of enemies. <sighs> the bottom is a loss. Uh, it's something you might use later. Uh, it allows you to muddle a bunch of enemies, which is great. Everything within range 3, which is huge. But also, you can force them to move too. So if you have a crap ton of traps set up, you can make them step into it. Or if there's like hazards and other stuff down. It's a good loss, but it requires quite a bit of setup. The biggest thing is here is, I don't think the top of this is as universal. And I think the bottom's conditional. So I do think it's a slightly weaker card just because... I'm just not as big fan of it, but again, if your party needs healing, this suddenly goes from um, only a decent card to a very good card. Um, also, that bo that bottom can actually win rooms if it's set up correctly. So, not knocking it there, but um, you're definitely going to have a lot of setup, and, um, and especially if you look at like a scenario if it's like designed by Marcel and there's like 50 million things in it, maybe the bottom is going to be useful anyway without even setup. Honeypot. It's going to be good. Just ignore everything. Initiative 18. Congratulations. That's really what you want to see. Initiative 18 and look at the bottom move three. That's that's already a good start. The rest of the text on the card is really, really, really good. But that's just a good start because getting a move that's be above two and initiative below 20 is a just a very good start. However, at the bottom of Honeypot, you get to create a heal two trap after the move. The heal two trap is huge because first off, move three. Great. Initiative 18. Great. Getting a heal trap. Great. Bottom trap great so the, you compare this with like caltrops to drop two traps bu, 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 move three and then just drop a healing trap or drop move three drop a healing trap then to caltrop another area ultimately this is one of those ways that you can start setting up your big thing that also this will allow you to in the middle of your little trap while you're setting up allow little points where your allies can move through and they're like thanks fam and you'll be like no problem it's just wonderful the top is a loot which is fantastic. And then you can potentially drop traps on top of loot if you don't loot them. Um, I am greedy as hell. I've actually never used that functionality because I just always want the loot, but um, it has its uses, I'm sure. I Just pick everything up. Just pick up the loot. <laughs> Electrified net. The bottom is the strength and trap. 
That's all it is. It's adjacent. You don't. They have no range on it. The initiative sucks at 48. This, this, this is. There's a lot about this card that's really hard to use. The top is a loss. So, is this card good? Yes, yes, it is. Um, because you get a strength and trap adjacent to you, it's fantastic. However, it depends on your group. If your group has uh, fewer people that are for, or relies a lot on summons, because summons like look at strength and traps and go, no fam, not for me. Uh, and sometimes you do have some uh, characters that to draw fewer attack modifier cards, uh, including yourself. You don't actually use it as often. Um, but if if that's kind of your group, this card's actually probably not going to be that awesome. However, if you do uh, have a group that uses those, being able to zone off a little bit by dropping an extra trap with a bottom action, I know it doesn't have a move built into it, but just to having a strength and trap on it is significant. When set up correctly, this can be another one of those giving an ally strength in for two turns and advantage on all those attacks. I think it's definitely been paired best with the blink blade so far but i'm sure it would go well with a lot of other classes some of them are locked and i don't want to talk about other locked classes in this video but safe to say strength and traps have a lot of value throughout the whole campaign the top of it stun traps uh it's very good just to drop three stun traps uh stun traps are great but it is a loss however if you really need to wall off um part of a room this is this is the way to do it because you can potentially screw over multiple enemies but as they step through traps and three stuns sound fantastic but you're going to need to constantly patch the wall to get them to do that or like knock them into it it's harder to use than it sounds but you have a so although i love strength and traps and although i love stun traps the fact that the bottom has no movement on it the fact that the top is a loss means that this is far more of a conditional card than anticipated. Um, the middling initiative just doesn't save it. So this is a card where in the right group is insane, with the right scenario is wonderful, but just be wary to bring this when it will be most useful. The card's just not that versatile. And then the last of the traps, which is kind of a hybrid of everything we talked about, is improvised improvement. The top is your highest damage trap, but you do need to destroy a trap so it doesn't allow you to further wall off enemies. Uh, you replace a trap with a, with a five damage wound trap, which is very good, don't get me wrong. Uh, but you can like turn those Caltrop traps where it's like, oh, it's only one damage. Congratulations, it's five damage wound now. Ooh. And the bottom is a move and then drop a blessed trap. Uh, I really loved doing this because um, just be able to move, reposition, drop a blessed trap ended up being really good and then as i started to replace traps like uh some of the lower like the one or two damage traps i'd flip them over to the five damage wound ones and then start to working with that um depending on what was available this is i think one of your stronger cards to start off with because move and a bless is always good even though it's only a move two the initiative does suck on it 58 on the initiative is not very good but uh, move two and bless is hard to argue with uh, especially because you can zone out people and then your allies can just go through it's another one of those you can build this into your trap wall and then allow enemies to um, not move through it and allow the allies will. Uh, meanwhile, the top is good at accelerating, but it's not as good for control. So for damage, it's good, but for control, it's, it, it, it doesn't help with it. So um, it really depends on how much setup. And regardless, despite that, I did use it a lot. So uh, I, I don't want to seem like I'm down on the card. It's very good. So that's all the traps, but you have a lot of utility. So let's get into the two attacks. First, you have Flurry of Nails. Flurry of Nails, um, this is a card I really wanted to love. 68 initiative isn't really great. Uh, jump three seems really good. And every time you move through a trap during this movement, uh, improve the value of the trap by one, which it, it sounded so good. And attack three with a push. Um, this ended up over my experience, and maybe this is just my experience, uh, get it up, got rotated out fairly reliably. And I think part of the reason is I did get a level two card that effectively did what it did, but better. There is a path of pain, I think, really deprecates this very hard at level two. Uh, so that possibly was it, but it's not like this card is bad. It gives you a an attack, which is something you don't have much of. It gives you some push, which with traps is very useful. And it gives you a jump, which is always good. So it's got some uses, but just keep in mind if like you're trying to fit a card in, the value of this really diminishes, in my opinion, fairly quickly. On the other hand, Exploding Decoy is something I use significantly more often. An attack two, so it's got a lower attack, but further range at range four. To attack two at range four is very strong, but then a pull two. I found that pulls have been way easier to deal with to getting people through traps than pushes. 
Uh, just because they can be far away, you can set some stuff up and then just rake them through it. And that's great. The bottom allows you to move three and then you leave a two hex trap in the hex you left, provided that the hex can have a spot. Like you can't just stand on a trap and then drop another trap on top of it. That would be cool, but it does have to be empty. Uh, that, that, that part ended up being pretty useful, especially as we started to get to Proficient Hunter at level 5, where I'm starting to drop 4 damage traps. Uh, leave that behind. That ended up being super fun. So, um, no, I, this, this card I used, I got way more mileage out of than Flurry of Nails, but um, both have their uses clearly because Flurry of Nails um, clearly has some jump on it where this doesn't. Furry Facade. So this is one of those useful cards where in some scenarios I ended up getting rid of it really early because it wasn't as useful, but in some scenarios it won the scenario. I'm actually looking at scenario 14. Scenario 14 people complain about. I've heard a lot of people upset over it. Um, this card won the scenario, just, just this card alone. So if this scenario requires like, hold hold the line, stay alive, survive for X amount of rent, like this, this scenario will win those ones. This card it will win you those. Um, if you need to distract enemies, dropping the en dropping the summon and allowing them to pull enemies or like um, distracting them, forcing them to like kill that thing uh, can play a huge role. Um, but I found the top to be significantly more useful, uh, especially for breaching. So if you want to like open a door, go invisible, or drop it, then drop some traps, or just long rest. Obviously, invisible and then long rest is like the most obvious combo that anyone's ever done. Uh, I think um, even like the the blink blade has some similar play uh, at level one with the experimental adjustment. So there's there's similar play you have here, although this one. Uh, typically, you want to do an early initiative with this, and this initiative sucks for that, but it's a good initiative because if you do need to go late, this gives you that option. So um, ultimately, the top is super useful for those scenarios, but you're actually going to find out that this is not going to be as great in every scenario. Bring it when you need it. It will win you scenarios, but it's not going to be useful universally. Dismantle. This is actually one of my favorite cards. Uh, so the initiatives later, which is good because you have quite a few middling and then a couple early initiatives. So this gives you the ability to go late. First off, chuck a trap. Just kill a trap near you and chuck it equal to the attack value. This can be really powerful, especially if you're trying to deal with flying enemies, because this doesn't have any restriction on it of like, hey, the enemy, like trigger a track or spring a trap against an enemy or anything like that. It's just attack. Now, one of the best parts about dealing with uh, enemies via trap is you can usually bypass shields, and this turns it into an attack, which kind of brings the shield thing back in. So if you're fighting high shield enemies, find other ways to deal with it than dismantle. Uh, but this is going to be your bread and butter for like trying to like give yourself advantage with a thing and then toss a big mega trap onto like a boss or something like this. This 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 is going to be primarily how you do it. Um, either that or toss like big things on enemies or if you don't have enough, if you have the ability to ramp up a lot of damage traps but not as much zoning or like congratulations they've now gotten past the whole wall now what do you do? Just start chucking traps at them directly and th that can be a really good way to do them. The bottom on the other hand is one of your big ways of stacking traps and one of the early ways for it until you get to level three uh this allows you to destroy a trap move three and then you put everything on that trap onto the next trap which is huge especially if you're like just trying to combine like hey uh i have this experiment the improvised improvements so attack five with a wound and i have over have the spike pit over here i'm just going to put them on top of each other and now you have an eight damage immobilized wound trap which um, I used that a couple times to deal with like lurkers and algox. Uh, as I like, I'm gonna wall this off with some caltrops, and they're like, "Well, I need to step through one trap," and they ch step through the absolute worst one. And then after the wound, they're like down to like one or two health, and all the other people just need to like punch it once, just gently for them to die. It was just one of my favorite things. So uh, this this mantle for both tops is this is basically a core card. I don't consider it an X, but um, yeah, I, I brought it so many scenarios. Uh, yeah, and plus it allowed me to, like, uh, show off with that big energy. <laughs> Last but not least, Spring Loaded. Um, the biggest conditional card. I know it's like, hey, look, Initiative 15. That's the undercut we want, but the card's way too conditional to use it like that. Um, uh, which sucks, because you don't have a reliable undercut. And that actually backfired a few times. Um, if you need to get one of the scenarios where you need to GTFO, that top trap is actually really good. If you're like, I'm going to put this into play, and then like, hey, there's a healing trap here, and like, uh, use Honey Pot, Enticing Bait, or um, uh, Electrified Net to drop... Um, good traps for them and watch as they're able to shoot across the map especially for those like i need to escape we need to get out we need to move those scenarios are huge 
and this will allow you to kind of help those allies out. I haven't used it. It's good in those scenarios, but it's incredibly um, useless outside. I'm going to be honest, it's not that great outside of that. But against those scenarios, it can be huge, especially scenarios that are filled with water that require you to get to a certain point. I'm looking at one specific scenario. Um, the bottom, on the other hand, is something you're going to be using quite often because you're like, well, no, there's flying enemies. Here's how you do it. Pick an enemy within three. They don't have flying. It lasts forever until you get rid of this card or until they die. That's, that's it. You just pick an enemy and they, they don't fly anymore. So boom, they don't have flying. And this is great for like ice rates, which are, they take a lot of the scenario weight out of it because uh, they, 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 they take a lot out of the room. So once you take flying away from them, which is one of their biggest things, especially if they're in melee form, watch as they become notably more easier. Just an added note about this class is that's something I've noticed. So Spring Loaded is going to be super useful. It's going to be your one way of dealing with those at low levels. So now we've gone over level one. Uh, primarily, you're going to be using these cards. Um, I don't think it really matters if you're going to be going you're going to be dealing with these healing and support traps a little bit more if you're going to go leader. And you're clearly going to go all in on the damage and uh, wound stuff if you're going towards the damage build. But ideally, you're probably going to be using the same nine cards core and you're going to rotate through these three, which I consider uh, the actual X cards. So a couple of adjustments here on my end, but uh, I'm sorry, Isaac, I'm just going to change the X and one on a couple cards, but this is primarily what you're going to use. As we start to level up, the card ch changes are going to be a little different though. So level two is Path of Pain and Unavoidable Outcome. Unavoidable Outcome is something if you want reliability or if you just hate dealing with flying enemies. I know Spring Loaded is like your solution for it, but if you don't like I mean, it's, it's annoying. I'm going to be honest, I don't like using Spring Loaded, but you have to. It's you, you feel compelled to. Whereas Unavoidable Outcome can make it to where you can control that certain enemies will trigger certain traps, especially if you're using Spite Pick more often, and you can use the top to add a little bit of damage and force traps onto enemies, especially if you want to like execute them before they start taking actions, or if they are like, hey, I'm not even going to move. I'm going to be doing this like uh, spawning thing. I'm going to create a summon, and they're like, well... I need to kill it. Go right next to a big trap, hit them with it, and this is a good thing. So, although this 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 reduces variance, its ceiling is worse. It doesn't provide as much value, but it really helps with your biggest enemy of flying or enemies that have jump that might screw you over and like, well, I was counting on them to do that, but they drew the jump card. I know that can be super annoying. So that can mitigate that. So not knocking that, especially if you're dealing with wind demons, um, well, yeah, wind demons, flame demons, although flame demons are going to possibly retaliate onto you. The range is pretty good on this, so you'll possibly be able to avoid it. Regardless, the initiative does suck on it, but um, it, it adds some reliability. On the other hand, Path of Pain is one of the best way to get one of your masteries. Um, I'm going to go into masteries at the end of the video, but Path of Pain is, you remember I was saying about how um, Flurry of Claws got like deprecated? This is it. So instead of attack three, push one, it's attack three, push two. And then you add another push two every time they hit a trap with no maximum. So uh, despite the fact, I, I I know I always wanted to get the big, biggest thing set up on that. The highest I've ever gotten was before they died as a push eight which uh, they died at the fourth trap, sadly, which was a boss, so that was fun. Um, combining with Persistent Pitfalls at level six, so we'll talk about that when we get there, but um, Path of Pain is one of your best ways to knock enemies through traps, especially if you have several lined up. Uh, just knock them through the whole line, and you can do a crap ton of damage. Not only that, because you can get it's very easy for this to turn into a push four, and push fours is usually when you start to get into effective disarm territory too. So even if you're only like knocking one enemy through one trap, it's very easy to, unless they have a move four to get back to you, they'll probably spend their next turn just moving, not attacking, and then you've got a lot of capacity to move from there. Plus you move them through a trap and did three damage to them, so by the time they get back, they're going to be hurt. The bottom, on the other hand, gives you two traps to work with, which is very good for zoning. That's one of the main reasons I used this was not necessarily the top, which I used plenty of times, by the way, but the zoning. Drop a wound trap, and then move to drop a wound trap. Um, the funny part, by the way, if you pair this with caltrops, you drop four traps, and then if you leave just one little thing off, you can start to make enemies take a long way around. I know there was one scenario in particular where we had a couple people do a couple setup turns where we try to get some stuff into play. Um, 
and then we were like let's let's go to town and we're just creating four traps immediately um we only actually had to deal with like one monster hitting our face and then we dealt with them and then we only dealt with one at a time so this is one of the best ways to get those out plus wound is actually still pretty strong i know it's just only wound in the middle of an enemy turn isn't as strong but you can also use this for those like replace traps options although there's only one at level one you'll get a couple options later that and this ends up being useful for but primarily for zoning off enemies this is the way to go i'm very biased because i do like the card i say that if you're going for more of a support build that maybe you might lean towards unavoidable outcome just to make sure you're able to get those but i think almost any build is going to just lean towards path of pain unless you absolutely hate flyers or maybe your group doesn't have the ability to deal with it very well i think this is more of a feeling but i i i don't i always like path of pain more than unavoidable outcome uh, and I think every build, if played effectively, I think every build could probably benefit from Path of Pain more, uh, if not because the bottom provides more zoning, which reduces more damage, and the top is kind of a far more effective finisher than the top of Unavoidable Outcome, although the top of Unavoidable Outcome clearly is a much better, ba better way of dealing with flyers. Pyrotechnics. So Pyrotechnics is one of your better support traps at level 3. The only difference is Pyrotechnics, when you, the top is used to its fullest extent, is incredible. Uh, if you give an ally strength and you heal them for three and then they draw that bless sometime, the, the, the value from that, and let's say also in the process before that, you this trap caused an enemy to miss their turn because they had to move around to disarm. So a disarm, heal three, a crit, and a strengthen, which add usually averages to almost one it's under one i forget the exact line. but it's it's effectively almost a damage um that's that's significant that's so much the problem is usually you're not going to get all that to line up sometimes you're going to shuffle some blesses into the allies deck and they're not going to get drawn sometimes they want the advantage now but they're actually at full health sometimes they need the healing but they're not going to be attacking so and, and sometimes you're going to drop it but you just need to put it in a place that's easily accessible and you're not going to be able to disarm or wall off an enemy i'm not calling it a bad card it's actually an incredible card with a huge ceiling of what it can do but more reliably it will just be a good card um but the best part about this is, even though I love the top, the bottom is really good too. So this is this is definitely one of the cards where both sides of it are super powerful. Because the bottom is a move three, which is good, but then the next time you drop a trap this turn, increase the damage or healing of it by three. So if you're like, hey, I'm gonna move up and drop a seven damage boar catcher, yeah do it that's fun or i'm gonna drop a seven damage enticing bait hey someone walk into it or it's just so good i i personally am a huge fan <sighs> cocaine i'm i'm a huge fan of this and i think it's a very good card i do think it's sad that it's opposite extra teeth because that's the one i end up leaning towards but pyrotechnics is also very good extra teeth is a i mean boar's trap better um not only is the damage better, yeah, but the range is better out to range three. Range three is one of the best ways you can, the best ranges you're gonna be able to toss traps out to. Um, although the five damage trap I used plenty of times, I used extra teeth plenty of times more often just to start stacking traps. So move two, then pick every trap adjacent to you, destroy them all, and put them all the effects from all destroyed traps this way onto one trap within range two. So effectively after you've like walled off a bunch of stuff, like well what do i do with this cram it all down put it ahead like double it and pass it on to the next guy that's that's really what this is in trap form watch as you just take all the stuff put it all in one move it forward so if you're like oh we cleared all this room hold on let me pack all my things and move on like this is this is great for that i i, I love it especially because you can like toss another trap later and then dismantle and move that newly big mega trap on top of your new trap with the bottom of dismantle and just keep like hockey pucking one trap forward until you get a big mega trap so i love the top of it it is good but i, I th both halves of this ends up getting useful because you're going to want to drop some five damage traps you're going to you're going to eventually need to drop a large volume of traps anyway but you're also going to want to merge them to begin with however even then like five damage traps sounds great it's only one damage better than your level one card and the level three bottom for the extra teeth is just harder to find um, other replacements that do as much value as it. So um, what I'm trying to say is both sides are really good. 
The leader build clearly goes for Pyrotechnics because that's one of the best support traps in the game. Um, I think Control, you can go for either. Extra Teeth, although it does give you another trap, uh, a lot of times you're going to be dismantling the traps you have for Control, but sometimes if you built up a big wall and you haven't used all of them, you're going to want to move them into the next room, so they're going to use that. However, uh, Pyrotechnics for the Control build is also really good because it gives you another uh, good trap to work with. So I'd say feel what you want. The damage build is obviously going to pick Extra Teeth. I don't think I need to elaborate why. Level 4. So Stalker Spoilers is going to be the default card for most builds. Uh, guess what? You have that undercut you want. And like, so one of the things, like, the Spring Loaded was the, the undercut that you wanted, right? Except it was too hard to use. So is Stalker Spoilers easy to use? The answer is yes. Ignore everything about the card except for the bottom. Move 2. Nice. Heal self. Nice. Loot. 1. So not only do you get to move and loot everything next to you, but you heal one which is great if you just need to knock off some stuff you don't need big mega heals for yourself but then you also heal one for everything you looted during that loot action so this can quickly um heal <laughs> off some stuff and not only that but it gives you the initiative 10 undercut on a good thing so the bottom's universal but what about the top this is super good for zoning three two heal three traps that's super good uh, not only does it give you two traps but they're easier especially if you have a large group of people where you need to wall off an area but now your enemies your allies are like well that's annoying that the whole, the whole area is now dangerous no they're dangerous for enemies but not you so uh watch as you have a great initiative and your allies are going to be thanking you for walling off those things so this is one of the best ways to have med damage mitigation at all because not only can you create two traps because of this but then once your allies can get into the fight by where you toss these two traps they'll be able to step through it or step through it later and just heal through it or you can just step through it during later turns and heal yourself if you took a couple hits on the way there dangerous ground you're going to be wanting to use the top way more often so although the bottom is very tempting by very tempting i think i've used it four times ever but when it does trigger god it's so good there are certain scenarios where that's incredible the bottom is super powerful and it's going to be one of those where you're in the final room you've got a lot of traps laid out drop it in the interim though gives you two three damage traps especially when you pair this like extra teeth like let's say you did drop that um a boar catcher and then you're like hey dangerous ground and then extra teeth that's just a two damage turn where you've now turned that into a 10 damage trap uh, and then you can just uh very easily chuck it at an enemy the next turn or use it for whatever purposes you want it's your 10 damage trap uh figure out what you want to do with that trap but this is definitely one of those um cards where it's you can very easily use um the stacking of things also if you need it to wall off things this clearly is a much better version of caltrops because it's almost two boar catchers so it clearly um deprecates caltrops top here but caltrops bottom obviously the move five is still kind of hard to bitch about i think anyone could take starker spoilers even the damage build um it's just a really good card however if you are like want to do the extra teeth toss a damage trap dangerous ground is the way to go so i'd say most striker builds are going to be going for um dangerous ground i think any build should take any other build should go for stalker spoils and even if you are going the striker build um stalker spoils is not a bad pick regardless level five lure of the snare and proficient hunter this is one where i uh, know lure of the snare looks good and it is good and it's a good way of like dealing with another way to spring traps reliably but this one is just i i feel like it's a crutch card I think Lure of the Snare is very good if you like, look, oh, flying enemies, and especially if you took Unavoidable Outcome, don't take this, but it's it, it feels like a crutch to me. I feel like, I don't know, the initiative's not great, um, it does rely on like, hey, you do, it, it's like Explosive Decoy, but the numbers are higher, like pull three is great, don't get me wrong, and the bottom is like, uh, you get to jump three and then trigger a trap, congratulations, but I don't know. I'm, I'm just not a big fan of Lure of the Snare. Um, I, I'm sure some builds can take it. I, I'm going to just suggest every build to take Proficient Hunter because it's just more fun. Um, so Proficient Hunter, move five, drop a regen trap. Uh, we're going to talk about the top more often, but first off, I don't care what build you're going. Move five, drop a regen trap, deprecates almost all your mobility to, and gives you zoning. So if you're going for control, the only problem is if you're going for damage, the move five regen is not the way to go. But if you're going for damage, the top of Proficient Hunter just wins anyway. So uh, I, every build should take it. Uh, unless you really want to use Lure of the Snare. Or maybe you're struggling a bit. I think Lure of the Snare will make it the class easier if you are 
having a little bit of a hard time with it. So I'd say if if you're, you're struggling a little bit with flying enemies or certain types of enemies or bringing the right card to the scenario, go with Lure of the Snare. Let's talk about the Top Up Proficient Hunter. So the Top Up Proficient Hunter says the first one trap you place every turn gets plus two to it. Now, this is one trap, only one, but this quickly adds up. So uh, I know some people are like, well, the first turn's set up. No, play a bottom, like uh, Explosive Decoy or Honey Pot uh, with the first turn. So drop it immediately, and that Honey Pot becomes a four healing trap. Move three, drop a four healing trap. Uh, or like, I'm going to move um, out of the way and drop a four damage trap in my wake, then drop some other traps, and then extra teeth them all together. The, 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 the ability to stack stuff up becomes so much more rampant. This ramp, this quickly adds up to, over the course of a scenario, I'd say easily 20 or more points of effort for a loss. I know it's like, well, your hand size is small. Yeah, it is, because you're a small rat. But this, there's no reason for this to not add up to more effort than any other card you have. Um, and this this is the way to go for damage builds. Additionally, any of the like replace builds, like um, improvised improvements, or when you get to persistent pitfalls, the top and bottom later, and um, extra teeth. Once you merge everything, you add this value to it. Because uh, whenever you destroy and create a trap, uh, the create this actually still counts. So um, any like the the improvised improvement says five damage wound. No, this is a seven damage wound if you like replaced a crappy trap with a, a good trap. Especially since it's only once a turn. So you could be like, well, let me uh, create this weaker trap, and this will add the plus two to this good trap. Destroy the weaker trap and replace it with this, and then add the two on top of it. You can start to see the best ways to uh, move forward with it. Like I said, I suggest every build take proficient hunter. Level six. Uh, persistent Pitfalls. Let's talk about that. Um, so Persistent Pitfalls. I love this card. Uh, the bottom is basically now my boss killer. Uh, so I just uh, Zerg a trap together, la -da 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 -da, combine it, and then um, I had uh, an item that allows me to just pull an enemy. It doesn't do any damage, just pull an enemy. But like, uh, I'll place a, a trap in front of me, and I'll pull them into it, and then drop it behind them, and then I'll Path of Pain with Persistent Pitfalls. And the 13 is a good undercut. So it's it's I've never had a boss draw screw this up because uh, I think the boss's earliest initiative is a 13. I think they have like a 13, a 14, and a 17 or something like that. Anyway, whole point is is uh, knock them into the trap, then create a, a half of it plus two uh, behind them, then punch them through it, and then make them step through that repeatedly because it says and immediately after a trap with a value within uh, it immediately for the rest of the turn when a trap is sprung. Um, as long as the value is two or more, uh, create a new trap with half the value uh, damage trap. Like So you can just, with Path of Pain, just create this corridor of death, like a, a path of pain with some persistent pitfalls. It's amazing. However, if um, you're not in the scenario for that, or like the it's going to fall off after like a couple ticks, or you don't have the setup, that's okay too. Uh, the top is incredible. Um, so with Extra Teeth and Path of Pain, by the way, you can uh, drop... Uh, wound trap, wound trap, replace one with a six, uh, damage, tra six damage stun trap, which with Proficient Hunter becomes an eight damage stun trap. Extra teeth that together, rip, to turn that into a ten damage stun wound trap, and use the top of Dismantle to lob a ten damage stun wound trap at them. That requires no setup, you just one turn of setup to drop two traps, which is good for zoning off stuff anyway, then chuck it for ten damage stun, you can do this every rest cycle. Um, get that with like a spyglass, which is very easy to craft from your level one craftsman, and then be able to attack 10 stun wound with disadvantage every rest. Congrats. Uh, that one's doesn't even require, that one even gets past flying. So if you're have, struggling with flying, this is the way to go. So that's, that's one thing you can do with it. So then the other side is Cage of Thorns, which I'm sure is a great card. Uh, honestly, the, the bottom's actually really incredible. Move three, then pick two traps within range four, and then you can now move them. So this is really good for um, picking where you want to relocate stuff, but then the top gives you a nice attack three at range, and then you trap, you put a one damage trap in everything next to them, which is huge for zoning, especially for other enemies. They might start to, as they start to uh, step through traps, paths could potentially make, and since you get to pick the, pick the path, you could potentially turn this into something huge for zoning purposes and block so much off. So I'm going to be honest, I think most builds should just take persistent pitfalls. I think control, if you do really, really like zoning things out, Cage of Thorns is probably the way to go, but the Sun Trap gives you a lot of control anyway. Support build is going to want the Stun Trap anyway, and obviously the damage build, the bottom and the top doesn't matter. 
is going to be good for that. So Persistent Pitfalls is generally my go-to for this level. Level 7, Foxhole is Dismantle, but you can target two enemies. Um, because, like I said, you're going to be doing like 10 damage traps pretty easily, turning it into ten, ten, that 10 into 9 isn't a big deal. Or like, like, oh no, I stacked a 15 damage trap, so I can do a 1 attack 15 or 2 attack 14s. Now they need to be right next to each other, um, but, you know... Also, unlike the um, uh, um, Dismantle, this has an experience tied to it. Um, Foxhole, ba basically everything I was talking about Dismantle and like tossing traps at things, this is toss a trap at two things. It's just really good. Plus it gives you a 90 initiative, which allows you to go very late, which you don't really have the capacity to. Um, the bottom is a summon defense grid, which high health drops a trap every turn. What's there not to like? It doesn't have movement. It does a ranged attack. A ranged summon should be good. Um, when I've tried this, it just was, I wasn't a big fan, sorry. Um, but the top's really good on it. Um, the, I, th I think the bottom's kind of a trap. <laughs> uh, it's the top, it makes it worth picking. That's all I'll say. Grasping hazards, first off, uh, that trap does do a lot, um, especially with Proficient Hunter, that two becomes a four, so it becomes far more deadly. But if you need to stack a bunch of debuffs on an enemy, especially if you have a group that can take advantage of that poison, or like, um, just, the curse is so good, uh, that, that, that goes a long way. But I think at this level, instead of like dealing with a bunch of status effects, you can usually just do a lot of damage. This is a good card, don't get me wrong, but... That, that top is super universal. That initiative eight undercut is huge. Also, the bottom is really cool if you can like just zone off enemies and maybe enemies like like you pick where they go and maybe they'll you can get them like on top of like traps. Just make them step into them. The, the bottom is really good because at the very least you can, this is a universal top that's good for a lot of things. And the bottom allows you to effectively deal with those flying enemies. So if you don't like spring-loaded... Honestly, don't take all the crutches. So if you're like, well, I took unavoidable... Just just pick one if you really get frustrated with dealing with flying enemies. Because this is one good way to do it. And then also, in the, unlike spring-loaded, um, this one has a move 2 built into it as well. So uh, Foxhole, clearly for the damage build. Uh, Striker's absolutely going to like it. Um, for the controller, probably all... Now, you're going you're gonna to want to go for the Grasping Hazards. Both of them pick Grasping Hazards. Level 8. Magnetic Shards. Uh, so, attack 2 on th range 3, target 3 with a push. Um, so, what, what what's kind of hard to use about this, and it seems really good at first, but ranged attacks that push are not nearly as good as ranged attacks as pull for the Trapper. It's harder to get... I mean, I know target 3 is really strong, but it's just harder to get the most use out of this. But depending on the scenario, you might be able to utilize some stuff that's already on the scenario, especially if there's like a lot of ice hazards or other stuff. This has some really good uses for it. But the bottom, on the other hand, is create 2, healing 1, uh, ward regen traps. That's super powerful. Uh, that, that, that can remitigate a lot of damage as well as recover a lot. So uh, don't sleep on the bottom. The bottom is very powerful. So although I'm iffy on the top, the bottom's so useful that I, I think this is just a good pick regardless. Spike Strip is such a fun card. I just want to say that this is, although I like, personally love Persistent Pitfalls, the Spike Strip is probably a competitor for one that brings some more fun to the class. Um, Persistent Pitfalls clearly being the, the queen of fun here. But uh, pick a Hex within range 4. Yay! And then on a path to it <laughs> a direct path to it create a two damage trap so also with um uh so that's that could be potentially a crap to, you can you can pick four traps with this and at damage two which is great and the bottom on the other hand is move three and then leave a path of immobilized traps so remember what i was talking about spike pits this is kind of another way of uh, creating immobilized traps. So even if you were like just doing your other combos to build up st uh, stacking traps, you can just move a little bit, drop some immobilized traps, and screw with enemies even further here. So this doesn't like scale with like level where it's like doing a huge volume of damage, but as enemies get more powerful, being able to immobilize them just becomes also equally more powerful. Spike Strip provides enough damage. I don't think the damage build... Honestly, the, the Striker build doesn't get a lot out of either of these cards as much, so... The spike trip's probably going to be where you want to go anyway because it provides that utility. Level 9. Ah, these cards are fun. So dangerous cargo every time. It's a loss, but once 
whenever you leave a hex during your turn, drop a 3 damage trap behind you, um, which adds up to more damage overall than um, Proficient Hunter. Ultimately, um, this is cool. Um, not as big a fan of it, as, but the bottom of it, super good. Uh, pick all traps within range 3. Just designate them. Then move 4. Hey, move 4 is great. And then, regardless of anything, relocate anything to adjacent hexes. So, if you have a crap ton of hexes, if you have a crap ton of traps dropped, move 4 and pick a crap ton of the traps and move them adjacent to you. Now you have a bunch of stuff to get ready to go, especially if you have like an extra teeth lined up for next turn. This is something to do with that. So, um, yeah, that makes this super valuable because, like I said, you, you, you're going to seem like you're going to want to drop all these traps and use them all. You will be leaving traps behind, and this is the best way of combining them into something useful. Then you have Mother of All Traps, and uh, she's a doozy. So you have to destroy three traps, yikes, uh, to create a nine damage, wound, poison, stun trap, and an empty hex within three. You have so many ways of just making a lot of these dud traps or small traps that destroying tree three traps isn't actually a problem. Huh. And then the bottom is move three, and then every time you move through this, uh, if you would spring a trap, you get to pick, not you, but a separate target within uh, adjacent to that trap and pick them instead. You can actually step through support traps and spring them on allies, and you can move through those damage traps at the end and force them onto, including flying enemies. So this is another way to deal with annoying flying stuff. So uh, Mother of All Traps is a really fun pick. I personally think... That, like I said, remember what it's talking about the bottom of Dangerous Cargo, though? It's too useful. A mother of all traps, you have to be end up like adjacent to enemies. So you have to be in pretty tight, tight quarters for the bottom to pay off, and it will pay off. Um, it's extra, But the top is super good for just being able to um, reduce incoming damage. So I think mother of all traps probably for the support build, but I think anyone, regardless of what you pick, should pick Dangerous Cargo. Again, if you want to pick Mother of All Traps, it's a good pick. It's not a bad pick, but I'd probably say any build could benefit from Dangerous Cargo with no problem whatsoever. Especially if you drop those healing traps for the leader build, who, um, uh, and didn't use them yet because something happened. You can just move all of them to the next room and see if you can use them there. So I think everyone likes Dangerous Cargo, but you could always go for Mother of All Traps. And even then the damage build, uh, if you're going for like more of a striker effect, I don't know if you'd use both Proficient Hunter and the top of Dangerous Cargo. That could add up to a lot, but I think you could potentially use this in place of it because once you start merging stuff with extra teeth and whatnot, uh, this adds up to one more damage around. Um, and regardless, the bottom's going to be useful. So you got that. Um, so I want to talk about the mastery. So the healing 20 mastery is pretty easy to figure out how to do. You use honeypot, enticing bait, and potentially pyrotechnics. Uh, if you really need to use flurry of claws to get the numbers up, you've got that as your option. Proficient hunter makes it easier to pull off, but ultimately you're just going to want to slap together a 20 point healing trap using dismantle, um, extra teeth, and whatever you've got. Um, the uh, stalker spoils also makes it significantly easier as you're going to stack this healing up pretty quickly. Um, I'd say this is not as useful a mastery. This is a scenario if you think think I got this because you're going to have to use these healing traps to like zone out enemies and then just constantly merge them together without using the heal and then create a 20 point heal. The thing is, it's very, very, very rare that a 20 point heal gets used. So this doesn't usually, it usually is more of a, a show off mastery. Uh, whereas the, um, the other one where spring seven traps is something you're probably going to want to be doing. Um, it, using some of the easy paths, like setting up the bottom of Path of Pain to create some wound traps, cow traps and other things, um, that's one way. But I'm going to be honest, I found very few scenarios where I was actually able to line up seven. But using uh, like a battle axe or equivalent items where it allows you to turn one damage attack into two, turning two a Path of Pain's attack three into two, uh, two targets, that's usually been the way to get the mastery but keep surviving. Uh, that's an easy way to get the mastery. Those are perks. Speaking of perks, let's get to those. Um, so, I know for a lot of classes, I try to like improve your modifier deck. Um, the non, the, if it, it should make sense, uh, scenario effects are super annoying because some of them um, make you like get like immobilized or other stuff like that, or you have to like deal with some annoying like curses or stuff like that. 
and uh, some of there's more variety of stuff you'll want to ignore scenario effects but the first one you're going to take is careful footing careful footing is basically mandatory because you're going to be dropping lots of traps sometimes if you want to like move through the other side you could play like can't hit me can't hit me by moving through your own traps and not springing them careful footing is clearly what you pick um i do think that the um uh, be prepared is also super powerful because it gives you some acceleration and some instant zoning so getting a free two damage trap is also super strong uh however also getting a one damage trap especially if you have persistent hunter if you're a profi proficient hunter if you have proficient hunter turning your long rest into heal to self drop a three damage trap is super powerful because that means that literally means it's normally some people like oh i've got a dead turn nah man you've, you've got a good turn you're dropping a three damage trap on your dead turn on your long rest and you're going to want a long rest more because in my opinion because your hand size you're probably not going to um want to plus since so many cards are part of a toolkit you're not going to want to randomly lose cards so it, it's it, i think you want more control so you're going to be long resting more than other classes so that's a perk that you take otherwise you're going to just want to optimize to get rid of the minus twos to make sure that when you do use foxhole and dismantle uh, you're going to want to be getting rid of the negatives because uh, for obvious reasons additionally the turning the pluses into immobilize is obviously super powerful because if you are like put if you path of pain someone and hit that into immobilize you not only have they taken all that but by the end of it they're immobilized and they're basically not gonna be able to walk back on their next turn they're gonna have to take another turn so that's a huge measure of control for the perks as well so i know that was a lot and i hope that was super helpful so out of all those builds do which do you like the most the leader the controller or the striker um are you gonna try the trap class now i know a lot of people are like i don't want to the trap or it's weak uh hopefully i've convinced you that it's worth playing and giving you some ideas on how to play it i know that uh personally that there's like a lot of setup you can do with like proficient hunter um a couple of the ideas like when i was talking about persistent pitfalls the path of pain and uh, extra teeth and to dismantle which is something you can use at level six to get a very reliable attack 10 <laughs> uh stun wound non-loss stun wound at level six i know that's level six but um that was really fun by the way but um just some of the things that you can do if um you've had some of your own fun effects let us know uh if you had a really cool path of pain that actually triggered seven traps without having to add another target well i'd love to hear about that as well so i hope this is super helpful if this is if it did help let us know in the comments and uh, if you actually want to hear what class we want to do next, I'd love to hear that as well. So um, so thank you all for watching. It's obviously wonderful to have you here. So also uh, thank you to our patrons. Uh, I know this was heavily requested from you guys too. So hopefully this uh, you enjoy this. I always appreci appreciate all of you. You guys are wonderful. Our Inox tier patrons here um, are great. Uh, they do get uh, early access to all of the guides, including this one. So if you want early access and the ability to vote when I do put polls back up there, I kind of have been kind of crappy over the past few months but uh it does at least give you early access as well as access to the patrons only channel in my discord so if you do want to join the discord i'll have a link in the description as well so uh thank you patrons for supporting the channel you all look wonderful and thank you all for watching 